All right. This is the third of, of uh, five sessions that I am doing this summer on knowing and doing God's will. Uh, you can listen to this one straight up, but I would encourage you also to check out the previous two. Uh, the first is uh, on knowing God through knowing God's will. And then we talk about how do I know God's will for my life? How do I determine what God wants me to do? And today I want to introduce to you a principle that I first discovered, I think reading is 15 years ago or more at this point. Um, the book was called Checkpoints for Seven Checkpoints for Student Leaders by Andy Stanley. And it was talking about what are the core things that we want our teenagers to know when they graduate high school, when they're sitting in their dorm room at college with mom and dad not around, with, with all of their spiritual authorities not around, and now they have the freedom to make every decision in the world. And so the principle is this, maximum freedom is found under God's authority. Maximum freedom is found under God's authority. And as I have been thinking about this in relationship to this idea of knowing God's will and doing God's will, it reminds me of a book that I recently came across. And the book's been out for a little while. Maybe you've heard of it. It's called The Paradox of Choice, Why More is Less by Barry Schwartz. Um, the best illustration I can give of this is uh, if you've ever been to Cheesecake Factory, which is one of my favorite restaurants in the world, um, I realize that when I go to Cheesecake Factory, there is this level of anxiety that I have whenever they hand me that novel of a menu. It's not just a menu. It is it is like a tome. I mean, there must be 35 pages of, pot, well, every other page is an advertisement. So only down to 15 pages of potential choices to make at Cheesecake Factory. And that's just for the meals. And then they bring out the, the list of cheesecakes at the end. And there are 25, 30 cheesecakes. And one of the things that I've realized is that the bigger the menu is, the more stress that I have that I'm making the wrong choice, that I'm going to miss out, that I'm not going to get the best. And so I have figured it out at Cheesecake Factory. It's down to this. It's down to the um, Cajun chicken jambalaya pasta, which is my absolute favorite, but I go into a coma after I'm eating. The Thai lettuce wraps or the sweet corn tamales. That's it. I've limited 35 pages of meals down to one. And then when it comes time for dessert, I don't even need to see the menu because I'm getting the white chocolate raspberry truffle cheesecake from the Cheesecake Factory, which is one of the greatest things that I've ever eaten in my life. So I have taken the 35 pages and limited it to about three and a half choices. And my life is so much better because of it. And I think that's a principle. Um, paradox, the paradox of choice is, is playing out uh, on the long term, which is we have reached this point in society where there are so many choices for so many things that, that we are not at a level of freedom. We're at a level of paralysis. You know, you think about our poor kids when they're told you can be anything in the world. Well, it feels like now my possibility is anything in the world. And that's a real challenge. Um, you can do anything you want to do. Now, we know that that's not true, but we tell kids that. It's like, I'm looking at my kids. You're not going to be an NBA player. You're not going to be an NFL player unless you figure out how to be the long snapper. Uh, you're just not wired for that. Sorry, dad didn't give you the right genes. Um, but when we tell kids that, that you can do anything you want, and when we, you know, they come to their dating relationships and it's like, you know, there's everybody in the world. What if I make the wrong choice? We end up getting paralyzed by so many choices. And so what you find is that um, you don't have freedom by having unlimited opportunities. Um, and you don't have joy because you have unlimited opportunities. And, and, and Barry Schwartz in The Paradox of Choice goes through some of the science of this, how it's legitimately true that the more choices that you have, the less satisfied you are with any specific choice that you have. Um, because you have stressed out about the choice. And then even once you make the choice, generally, um, you're still stressed out because maybe you missed out on a better choice. And so there's less satisfaction. And I have found this is one of two major reasons that I would say maximum freedom is found under God's authority. So first and foremost is just simply seeking to obey God's will. And, um, seeking to limit my choices to the things that I know God would be pleased with cuts out so many possible choices for me. And that's really a freedom. Let me give you an example. I shared this with, with our teenagers uh, this spring as we were talking, you know, I'm let's say I'm young and I'm single 
and I want to know who I'm going to end up with forever. And that's desperately difficult because there are 8 billion people in the world now. Well, let's use God's authority as, as a parameter here. Okay. What does God say? He says that, you know, God made man to be with woman. Uh, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave uh, to his wife. So we know that God's standard is that for a man should be with a woman, your spouse should be a woman. Okay. Well, that is restrictive, right? Because now all of a sudden there are 4 billion people who have been removed from my list of possibilities to be with. And some people can get upset at that. But to me, again, understanding this paradox of choice, well, that's freedom because that's 4 billion less people that I have to determine. Well, that's not the only parameter in scripture. God also tells us don't be unequally yoked with unbelievers. And so we don't just because, okay, I'm a man, just because somebody's a woman doesn't mean she's a good fit for me. Um, I want somebody who is in the Lord, um, not just somebody who says that they're a Christian, which if first off, let's take, the, you know, if they say they're a Christian, well, there's still 2 billion people on earth that identify as some form of Christian. Um, let's say half are men, half are women. Well, that's down to 1 billion. Okay. So that's great. Cause I went from 8 billion choices to 1 billion choices, but not everybody that says they're a Christian is truly following Jesus. And so what I want to do is I want to limit even the people that I look at for people who are legitimately seeking Jesus with their life. And I should know this, not simply because they say, yes, I'm legitimately seeking Jesus. I should be able to see this by the fruit in their life. Fruit. Do I see love? Do I see joy? Do I see peace? Do I see patience and kindness and goodness, gentleness and faithfulness and self-control? If I don't see these things, then I don't see the fruit of them following Jesus. One of the parameters that I tell students is if you really want to know what somebody's like, don't look at how they treat you. Look at how they treat the person that they have nothing to gain from because that's who they really are. And at some point, you're going to be that person that they have nothing to gain from. So if they are kind and gracious and considerate to people that they have nothing to gain from, then you can have confidence that that's their true character. But if, if they are manipulative, if they're demeaning, or if they're dismissive of people who are not up to their status or up to their level of, of gain, then you want to be careful of those people because at some point you don't help their status anymore. You don't have anything to offer them and you're going to be stuck with the consequences of their character. And so again, I'm limiting the choice by people that are truly genuinely seeking to follow Jesus. Now, the reality is there are still hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and thousands of people that fit that. And so then now I limit my parameters by, do we have common interests? Do we have the same direction in life? Um, do they click with my people? Do I click with their people? So, you know, that can be limited quite a bit, but you can see that just simply one of the beauties of the limiting factor of God's will is it cuts out a lot of choices from our life. Um, what am I going to do as a job? Well, I can go ahead and throw off those that are unethical, but also I can throw off those jobs that I know would be very detrimental to me being faith. If, if I want to be married, if I want to be a good parent, then I need to have a filter for jobs that are going to be very detrimental to me being a faithful spouse and a faithful parent. And so for me, I remember making a choice, um, before I was married, um, there was something that I wanted to do. Actually, I was, I was in a military school and I wanted to fly jets. And uh, I learned that fighter pilots uh, are away from home 180 days a year in peacetime. And for me, it's like, nope, I don't want to do that. I'd wanted to be a fighter pilot for years. And when I heard that, I was like, no, because I want to be a good husband and I don't want to be away from my wife and my kids half the year. So I made that choice. Uh, because I feel first and foremost that honoring God as a husband and as a dad is more important than whatever my job is. So that limited it down. But the other side of maximum freedom is found under God's authority. Isn't just that it limits our choices. So that'll be good. It's that it actually expands our freedom. You know, we all want freedom. And in some senses we would like to say, I want unlimited freedom, but we know that that's not a reality. Because for every choice that you have, there's a consequence. 
for every decision that we make, there's a decision that we have to live with. And so when we make decisions that are outside the parameters of God's will, when we make decisions that go against scripture, against what God's put down for us, then we're stuck with the consequences of that. Um, there's a great book, uh, Andy Stanley, or not Andy Stanley, I'm sorry, Sean McDowell, um, who I've had on the podcast before, Dr. Sean McDowell, has a great book written to teenagers called A Rebel's Manifesto. And in that book, he's talking about sex and sexuality. And, and he just poses this simple question, what would our country be like, or what would the world be like if everybody obeyed God's sexual ethic? Now, on one hand, we would say if everybody obeyed God's sexual ethic, then like, you know, people wouldn't have the freedom to be with who they wanted. People wouldn't have the freedom to give into their urges. And, and, um, you know, there would be a lot of like temporary pleasure that would be taken off the table. Okay. I'll give you that. But he follows through this thought experiment. What would the world be like if everybody followed God's sexual ethic? So that is sex inside a monogamous marriage for life. Well, what are some of the consequences in society for that? First off, you'd, you'd have uh, very few kids raised in single parent homes. By that point, it would only really be because of death that you have a child in a single parent home. Whereas now um, in the United States, 40% of children are being raised in a single parent home or a home where they're bouncing back and forth between divorced parents. Um, Every child would know their father. Whereas right now, I think it's 20 to 30% don't have any kind of real good relationship with their dad. Um, There would not be a sex slave trade. There would not be pornography. Um, The amount of violence would go down because a lot of the violence that happens ends up happening because of these physical relationships. There would be no more rape. Is this a good society or a bad society? I mean, this is incredible. If we would just simply obey God's sexual ethic, the amount of horrendous things, long-term societal consequences that we wouldn't have to face, um, we would get to enjoy the fruits of. Why? Because maximum freedom is found under God's authority. Uh, when we talk to our young people, we talk to our, um, our guys and girls every year on um, what it means to be a real man and what it means to be a real woman. And in both of those cases, one of the principles is expects God's greater reward. And what we're saying by that is that a real man and a real woman, as opposed to a boy and a girl, will forego short-term pleasure, forego temporary reward, expecting God's long-term greater reward. And so when we seek to honor God uh, with and, and do God's will for our lives, we're free from many of the devastating consequences of sin. We're free from the regret of broken relationships. We free ourselves from a lot of disease. You think about alcoholism and addiction and stuff like that. You're free from losing a ton of your money. Um, you're, you're free from a lot of major health consequences that you have, but you, but these are not things that you experience immediately with the decision. These are things that you experience over the long term by seeking to obey God. Maximum freedom is found in God's reward, but that's, but that is a long-term freedom. And so what we want to be as real men and women is people who can make sacrifices today, knowing that God will reward us tomorrow. And ultimately it's not about even just my reward here on this earth. It's taking that eternal perspective that my obedience today, the faithfulness that I have to God today gives me a freedom from um, freedom from destructive decisions now, but also a freedom to experience the reward of God on this earth, incredible relationships on this earth, but ultimately in a new heavens and new earth, where the Bible says that we will reign and rule with Jesus to the degree that we've been faithful with him in the short-term temporary decisions that we have now. And so I just encourage you today, um, you know, this is, these are, these are podcasts, uh, this series here, it doesn't matter if you're a parent, doesn't matter if you're married, this stuff applies. If you're a teenager, this applies. If you're a single young man or single young woman, or if you're a grandma and a widow or a grandpa and a widow, this applies. Maximum freedom truly is found under God's authority. It will take short-term sacrifice, 
but you will have long-term benefit, long-term reward. You will free yourself from the chains of slavery of long-term consequences. And like we talked about in that first, uh, first lesson in this series, by doing God's will, you know God and you experience the freedom of that relationship with God all the more. So, you know, coming to Christ, putting my faith in Jesus Christ means I'm saying no to every other religion. I'm saying no to worship of myself. I'm saying no to idolatry, to money and success and all of those things. But in the process, I get incredible freedom. I'm not, I, instead of, instead of being free to choose drugs, for example, I'm free to not choose them. I'm free to not give into addiction. I'm free to not give into slavery. I'm free to not hold on to bitterness and anger and these destructive things that tear me apart. Why? Because maximum freedom is found under God's authority. And so if you're experiencing some kind of slavery in your life right now, what I would encourage you to do is find out what is God's will in this particular area. Submit yourself to God's will in this area. And it may take some time, but experience the freedom that we get by serving God, honoring God, and honoring God with our decisions.